Welcome everyone to a brief history of Riverbank Acoustical Laboratories. Please put any questions that you have as we go into the chat and then um, Becca will read them at the end. Um, here we go. So Riverbank Acoustical Laboratories started with this man, Colonel George Fabian. He was the heir to a family with a very large textiles and dry goods distribution business that was originally based in Boston. And around the turn of the century, Chicago was the place to be for industry. And so he moved the headquarters to Chicago and became equivalent of a billionaire in today's dollars. He was known for being very eccentric for his time. There are many stories about different pursuits that he had. Some might be true, some might be uh, tall tales. Um, it, he wanted to use his fortune to fund obscure sciences, things that he had a fascination with, but maybe didn't have a commercial application at the time. And some of these pursuits ended up uh, leading to big changes or, or great industries, just like um, the Riverbank Acoustic Lab. So think of uh, George Fabian as the Elon Musk of 1900. His wife, uh, Nellie Mae Fabian, um, was also very eccentric herself. And for example, she had her bed mounted to the structure on springs to prevent any vibrations from entering her while she slept. And she was also very interested in um, uh, domestic um, plants and animal breeding, that sort of thing. They, the couple started this estate by buying up land at the end of the line, basically the furthest you could get from the Colonel's Chicago office by the commuter train at the last stop. And he bought up all this land and formed this estate that he called Riverbank. It was a place where he would fund the research and work of great scientists and artists. It was sort of a utopian community where people came, he paid their room and board and a modest stipend and they were able to do their work freely unencumbered by the the profit motive, basically. Um, there are a lot of interesting things on the estate. So our lab is right here. Um, and this road still exists. This is Route 31. The Fabian Villa was a small farmhouse that had a major expansion and renovation by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, he had a Japanese garden, um, which was built um, by a, a Japanese immigrant. Um, there was a, a Dutch windmill, an authentic um, Dutch windmill that was built by a German immigrant. Um, there were greenhouses where they were doing early genetic engineering experiments with wheat. So the workers and artists and scientists would eat wheat that was grown in these greenhouses and then ground by the windmill and baked in the, the kitchens on the estate. Here are some early photos of the estate. This is the windmill being constructed. Um, and the windmill still exists. This is a modern photo of what it looks like today. The Japanese gardens, the inspiration came to the Colonel after he was in Japan um, working to help defuse the Russo-Japanese War. And he came back and had one commissioned on his estate. This is a photo, an early photo of the Fabian Villa. Um, the story I heard is that he asked Frank Lloyd Wright that he basically wanted a house that was a mansion, but that looked like a small, modest house. And that exactly um, is how it turned out. So this um, building today houses a museum, and it seems bigger inside than it does outside. It's interesting. In this photo, there are the um, original greenhouses where they did the uh, experiments with plant genetics. The um, 
people that worked on the estate were encouraged to bring their families. So you had um, children running around playing um, during the day while their parents worked. There was an Italian sculptor that the Colonel commissioned to do all these little ornamentations. He did them in concrete, which was seen as being an innovative um, alternative to marble sculptures at the time, basically casting um, concrete. Those are found all across the estate even today and on our building. The colonel was funding a woman named Elizabeth Wells Gallup, who was an educator and a proponent of the Baconian theory of Shakespeare. This theory is essentially that um, the works of William Shakespeare were truly authored by Sir Francis Bacon, who was a, um, a affluent nobleman of, of note and couldn't, as the theory goes, would have been degraded by being seen as a mere playwright. So he published under the, the name of someone else. Um, I think this theory is pretty much discredited at this today, but um, it was popular at the time. Elizabeth Wells Gallup um, believes that she saw messages in the typeface of the first printing of the complete works of William Shakespeare, and that these subtle variations in the typeface revealed a Baconian cipher, an encoded message, that revealed the truth about the author and other secret occurrences that happened in his life. No one else was able then or now to recreate this method or to, to, to learn this method, um, but the colonel was funding her work in it. She also found plans for an acoustic levitation machine and um, the George Fabian was very excited about this. He, commission a craftsman to build the machine according to the plan. So there was a, a, a drum with um, wires that were tuned to a major chord, and then the enclosure as well had sympathetically tuned strings. And the idea was that as you rotated it, the sympathetic vibrations would cause the machine to levitate. Of course, it didn't work. Um, and so, um, the colonel was frustrated with this for a while, but we'll, we'll learn more about that later. In the meantime, uh, George Fabian also met a woman named Elizabeth Smith. He met her in the Chicago Public Library when she was visiting the big city from her rural home. And they, they met at the um, original portfolio of William Shakespeare that she was fascinated with and, and the Colonel was as well. And she really impressed him. And so the Colonel hired her uh, sight unseen to come live on the estate and to learn the um, code breaking techniques of Elizabeth Wells Gallup. Um, this Elizabeth Smith eventually became a very prominent figure in the world of cryptography. And there is a book I recommend about her called The Woman Who Smashed Codes. The, the, a gentleman, William Friedman, who was hired by the colonel to be a plant geneticist on the estate, fell in love with Elizabeth Smith. They eventually got married. These two became the most notable code breakers in the entire world um, at the time. So there were this is around the area, era of World War I, and Germany um, was communicating uh, encrypted messages, which were thought to be indecipherable over the telegraph wires. These two, some combination of these two, and possibly more Elizabeth, um, cracked that code and learned that Germany was trying to get Mexico to attack the United States or to, um, execute intrigue in the United States. And this is one thing that led to the US becoming more involved in World War I. They founded a school for cryptography on the Colonel's estate. He, the records seem to indicate that he received no payment for this. Um, he commit, he sponsored um, the Freedmen's and Elizabeth Wells Gallup to teach um, code breaking techniques to this group here. 
And then after World War I, the entire group goes to Washington, D.C. and becomes the NSA, National Security Agency, which is the U.S. government's uh, code breaking and an encryption wing today. So basically William uh, Freeman then goes to DC and leads that. Related to that uh, levitation device, um, the colonel was not willing to give up so easily on the fact that it just didn't work and he hired the top mind in acoustics to come and tune the machine. That was Wallace Clement Saving. And he, Wallace was a professor at Harvard. He is known as the founding father of acoustical science or architecture acoustic, architectural acoustics. He was saddled with the seemingly impossible task of trying to solve the poor speech intelligibility in the fog in the newly built fog lecture hall at Harvard. And by bringing in seat cushions from the Sanders Theater next door, he measured the change in reverberation time as he added additional square feet of seat cushions, both through this empirical observation and some analytical techniques, he came to um, this Sabin equation, which is basically the groundbreaking equation of architectural acoustics. This started the whole pursuit, and this equation is still used today um, in various um, ways both in predicting uh, reverb time as well as as the basis for the ASTM C423 procedure that we we do today. So he created the or started the whole field of acoustic of architectural acoustics. Uh, Wallace was um, happy to come out and look at the uh, levitation device, but he quickly realized it was more fantasy than physics. He convinced the colonel to abandon the project, um, but they became really good friends, both over their mutual interest in acoustics as well as their mutual support for the Allies in World War I. Um, Wallace was complaining about the conditions of his lab, which was basically a makeshift, um, repurposed basement cellar, and he couldn't get good data because the road traffic noise was so terrible that he could only run tests after the nighttime traffic had stopped before the milk truck started in the morning. He was complaining about this to the colonel and George Fabian said, if you design a perfect test chamber, I'll spare no expense and we'll build it for you on our Riverbank estate. And then you can come out and do your research. Um, in endless supply. So, and that's how this lab came to be. It was built in 1918. It was designed by Wallace Sabin. The chambers and a lot of the interior construction was designed by Wallace Sabin. And he consulted throughout the construction project. And the um, construction and the building was funded by George Fabian. And you see a lot of Fabian's eccentricities and um, just desire to have things a certain way throughout the construction. This is a, rent, a drawing that was done by Scientific American in 1923, and it really shows the construction and design of the chamber. Um, there's very massive masonry walls. These are greater than 12 inches thick um, all the way around and above the chamber, and then an airspace around the chamber, and then another outer structure. So this is still the gold standard of how chambers are built today. There was even a kind of rudimentary isolated floor that um, went in underneath, and some other side chambers that were built for different experiments. Now Wallace, um, by the time that the lab was finished, Wallace was working obsessively on helping the Allies to improve their aerial photography techniques. And he, so he was interested in photography, but also his acoustics and vibration experience helped him to figure out how, ways to reduce the vibration in the camera to get clearer photos. Um, he worked on this obsessively 
um, to the point of where he contracted a kidney disease and neglected treatment and um, which the disease got worse and worse. And then by the time he went in for treatment, it was too late and then died in complications due to the surgery. So he, he died relatively early and did not get to do the work he wanted to um, at Riverbank. His cousin Paul, um, Dr. Paul Earl Sabin, was a professor at Harvard. Um, he was originally from Illinois, and um, Paul came out and was the first person to run the Riverbank Acoustical Labs. He was the lab director from 1919 to 1947. Um, some of the early work that was done here, you know, has the name Sabin on it, but Paul lamented later on that he had um, two famous relatives with the same name that were also interested in acoustics, also did their work in acoustics. This shows how the tests were run in 1918. So the sound source was a rank of organ pipes, and because of the length of the pipe, you knew exactly what frequency. Um, was created by that pipe. The pipes were run continuously, or a single pipe was run in a steady state fashion, then cut, the, sort, the, the air was cut, and at the same time, a timing device was started. You would listen to the decay in this box, and then when you couldn't hear the sound anymore, you stopped the timing device, and that was your reverberation time at that particular frequency. So you have to remember at this time there were no voltmeters, so therefore there were no sound level meters. And everything that was done had to be done, measurement wise, was done by ear. Um, and so even though these techniques may seem imprecise by modern standards, they were ingenious in what they came up with. And it really worked. Since since there was some subjective element to the measurements, you repeated the tests for each pipe, and then you made the repeated tests at every single length of pipe, and that was for the empty room. Then you installed the material that was under test into the chamber, and then you repeated the measurements again. Because there were thousands of measurements in the test, you couldn't complete them in a single day, so you would have to sit in this box to uh, control for the change of clothing that you'd have over the course of the measurement. Um, in the 1920s, there, were, there was no acoustical products industry to fund um, the lab, so the lab did a lot of um, basically anything they could get their hands on. They developed materials, they developed patents for certain materials, um, Here's uh, something called Sabinite, um, which was an early precursor to acoustical tile. And they also did work on uh, listening devices. I believe the first paid test at Riverbank Acoustical Labs was evaluating and comparing the effectiveness of different um, hearing assistance devices, uh, mechanical ones, of course. Um, there was a, an aperture that was built in the upper level that to do transmission loss, and this is something they developed and improved over time. A building next door, a lot of people ask us about that, um, it was built from I, steel I-beams that the Colonel had purchased um, at a rail freight auction, um, not knowing what they were, and um, he brought them and brought his architect into his into his office, and they stacked up cigar boxes on his desk and into the shape that you see here, and that was the design for this building. Um, this building housed a tuning fork factory um, from the 1920s all the way to around 2000, and then it um, was partitioned off and became office space after that. Today, we have no affiliation with that building at all. It's, it's merely on our campus, or on the same campus. So, George Fabian died in 1936. Um, his wife uh, died two or three years later, I think 38 or 39. And 
In her will, she had stipulated that the acoustical lab had to go to a not-for-profit or an educational institution. And so Paul's son, Hale Sabin, this is a photo of him here, um, he had a relationship with the Armour Research Foundation um, and the Armour Institute. So the Armour Institute was started by Philip Danforth Armour, um, who is famous for you know, the meatpacking industry. Um, he was the wealthiest man in the country or the state or something like that, and um, donated money to start the Armour Institute, which was a, a university, basically. And the Armour uh, Research Foundation was started in 1936 and did um, private research uh, in a not-for-profit not uh, way for both the U.S. government and other industrial commercial entities. After World War II, um, the Armour Research Foundation uh, shifted its efforts and focus to repurposing the uh, war infrastructure or war science and research and development infrastructure to um, the commercial and uh, industrial sector. And so in 1947, officially, um, Riverbank Acoustical Labs um, was fully operated by Armour Research Foundation. But there was a relationship even leading up to that. But this is the official date we have. So in this era, we have uh, Luther Raymer, uh, lab director from 1947 to 1953. He oversaw much of the transition from the listening and organ pipe method. I think he's kind of making fun of the pipes here in this photo um, to the electro, early, early electroacoustic systems. Um, here's another photo, I think from the late 40s. Um, Ralph Huntley um, was the lab manager from 1953 to 1963. He is um, known for there was a dramatic shift in the, um, the rigor of the documentation. So we starting in under his era, we have records from every single test and every single test had a written test report. And this is also when the ASTM uh, acoustical standards were um, becoming very um, prominent and he conformed the lab to those standards. This gentleman here, you'll see a photo of him later on as well, was uh, Don Williams. He was the son of the Colonel's chauffeur. And so he really lived his entire life on these grounds. As a kid, he would run around and cause mischief. And then um, he started working for the Riverbank Acoustical Lab as a technician. He was also a radio enthusiast. And so a lot of the early photos have um, radio antennas. Our, the, the cupola at the top of our building is still to this day uh, filled with various radio equipment um, that he was tinkering with. This was the staff in 1953. Um, Lab manager or director Luther Raymer, Arlene Mundy, Roy Richards, um, I think Ernie Olson, um, Don Williams, Don Zadonis. Um, in 1958, they expanded and built um, a source room. They were starting to do sound transmission loss testing um, more rigorously. Um, and so the source room was expanded here. And then the, the main um, reverb chamber was um, used as the receive room. And then the test sample would be installed in this aperture here. So this room still exists. We use it as storage today. Um, the, the, the air volume of it is, is too small to be used by current standards, but it was a good stirring place. So here's some photos of the diffusers and the loudspeakers that they had in that source room. Uh, I think one thing um, people are surprised to see, even to this day, we are a workshop with microphones and sound level meters. Um, so we're just constantly building things and making things in our chambers. It's, it's a dirty business in terms of uh, dust and 
uh, drywall dust and that sort of thing, and uh, mastic and all these things. Some more photos of the 1950s. Um, this is a door that was set up for testing in that side chamber. So in 1963, the Armour Research Foundation changed its name to the Illinois Institute of Technology um, Research Institute. So this is a wing or arm of the Illinois Institute of Technology, which is a, a prominent school. Around this time, they also developed the, um, the white coatings, the paint that was used on the uh, Apollo uh, rocket program or the uh, Apollo modules and that sort of thing. That paint is still used today um, by SpaceX as well as NASA and the successors of ITRI still make that coating in Chicago. Um, the ITRI staff grew to about 1,850 employees. Um, around this time we saw a major uh, investment in the Riverbank Acoustical Lab. And so under Frank Tizer, we built a new sound transmission loss facility and uh, renovated most of the chambers. So in the early days, so 1920s to 30s, these um, volumetric diffusion pillars were put into place for the testing. Then in the 1960s, they removed those and went with the plate diffusion method, um, which did not consume air volume in the space. Um, you could have deeper depth changes, et cetera. However, interestingly, today, there's a kind of a renewed interest in volumetric diffusions. They're coming back in style. So um, around this time in the 1960s, they built the transmission loss facility. Um, it was a major undertaking that was funded by IIT Research Institute. We have some photos which show just the level of detail and care that went into the construction. So the, the test frames and the steel structure was put in first and then all the concrete built around. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see these removable frames we still use today and, and basically the building was built around them. This photo shows, um, this would have been in the new transmission loss facility at the time, the um, removable nine by 14 test frames. So you can build a filler with a custom opening for a certain client and then use it, um, come back and forth, or even as shown in this photo, um, a masonry wall where there's a long cure time for the concrete um, that can be racked and then reinstalled later. We have, this scale shown here, we still use the same scale today and it still has a current, or we, we calibrate it every year and it still meets all the requirements. This was the um, control room equipment rack that was put in in the 1960s. The rack still exists. Uh, many of the pieces were brought out or put back at different times um, we've we've cleaned many of them up and reinstalled them just for show today this entire rack of gear happens in a little tiny box that's maybe four inches by six inches uh, big and a, less than an inch thick um, william seekman um, was lab director from 1966 to 1972 when I was putting this together, I uh, learned that he actually just recently passed and I didn't even know he was still with us. So, um, but he was the predecessor to John Kopak, who was um, the lab manager from 1972 to 1998. Um, John literally wrote the book on our history and many of the stories that I told today of the early history with um, the Fabians and the Sabins that comes from John's book. And John was beloved by both customers and employees alike. In the 1970s, we built a, another 
enclosure on the side of the transmission loss lab, another large chamber. And the intention was to do automotive NVH testing. The riggings were put in place for a dynamometer, which um, was never fully installed, um, but we had the chain and the pillars and everything that would go along with that. Um, and even a uh, ventilation system uh, and everything. So for whatever reason, that work was never finished and it, that never panned out. However, we have this very large storage room, which we have pallet racks on, on all walls um, and is very, very useful to us. So we're, we're thankful for that, um, that chamber that was built that was never used. Here's some photos uh, from the 1980s. The eagle um, was struck by lightning and the wing broke and then they recast it in the 1980s. The frame change operation, still pretty much the same thing we do today. Um, this is the uh, floor slabs for floor ceiling testing going in through the four by eight opening. And then some early light reflectance tests that they did as well. Um, in the 1990s, the chambers got a fresh coat of paint. Um, the exterior, the, the buildings were owned by the Fabian Foundation, um, and they were starting to um, need a little bit of um, care on the outside. And so um, the Fabian Foundation eventually sold all the buildings uh, west of Route 31. to a private individual, or I guess different private individuals. Um, Don Williams, this was the gentleman I mentioned that was the son of the Colonel's chauffeur. He um, worked here his entire life, even in retirement would come and tinker on different projects. And then he passed away in 1998. Um, he built a boat in the front shop, a steam boat, which they took out on the Fox River. In 2002, the IIT Research Institute um, had a new CEO um, who his plan was to take a, that, that organization of IIT Research Institute and form a spin-off organization that would become an employee-owned corporation and would have a focus on Department of Defense work. Um, this was sort of at odds with um, the Illinois Institute of Technology's mission. So they worked together to, to form that agreement. And um, in 2002, it became official. There were about 33,000 employees that broke off. Um, several labs um, came along and Riverbank was one that came along for the ride. They, the company was called Alliance Science and Technology. They actually had a naming contest among the employees to, to come up with a name. And it was, I think, the son or daughter of one of the employees that came up with this name, a lion. Um, and then by their peak, they had 3,300 employees and a lion was eventually acquired by the Huntington Ingalls Industries in 2021, which was the world's largest naval shipbuilder. Here's a photo of the team here from 2000 to 2011. Um, David Moyer developed a software system which allowed the data um, entry by the technicians to be rapidly collected for the purposes of developing um, test report documents. And since even then we were doing close to a thousand test reports a year, um, that dramatically improves the efficiency of the operation. So um, this is a photo of the team from that era from the 2000s. Um, and then in the 2010s, I came on board as, as laboratory manager in 2012. Um, we developed a NAVLAP accredited field testing service in 2013, which continues to grow. Um, this is a photo of our team at probably the largest. Um, there's three uh, subcontractors in this photo and then the, the rest of our team at that time. We made significant improvements to the interior. So different um, 
places like this photo here shows the client lounge and then the front office and um, the exterior as well. We focus on improving our customer experience and improving efficiency, improving the quality of the test report documents and our quality management system. And we were able to break records in terms of test quantities, revenue, uh, new customers. It also helped at the time that uh, the business of acoustical products was booming. Um, the business of architecture was booming and acoustics is a rising concern. We improved the um, flanking limit in our trans, uh, floor ceiling transmission loss lab and also reduced the opening size, which made construction more cost efficient for our customers. This is Seth Prizer. He's our um, lead construction technician uh, subcontracted. Um, and here he is filling the concrete block with sand all the way around the lower chamber. And we developed a new uh, test system, um, new software, and we are using Bruin Care uh, Lanix Eye analyzers, so top of the line analyzers. And then we have a lot of the old equipment in the racks to, um, to show our heritage. And I just want to thank the test engineers that have been uh, with me over the years. So. Um, Currently, um, Keith Kimberling, um, Miles Possing, um, Chris Natoli, and Malcolm Kelly. Uh, this is uh, Dean Victor. Uh, many of you who have been here in the last uh, 30 years or longer um, know Dean. He wor started working for Itri in 1981. Um, and, and was with the company basically 41 years. He came to REL in the 1990s from their explosives lab. And he was, he may have the all time record for most acoustical tests performed of any individual on the planet. We don't have a way to prove this, but I really suspect that this might be true. He has done many thousands of tests over those years. So in 2022, um, something big happened. So we were acquired by, we were purchased from Huntington Ingalls who had recently purchased Alliance Science and Technology. We were sold to the Stevens Group. The Stevens Group bought both the business assets and the building um, that we operate in. Um, Stevens Group is a family investment firm. They have properties that they've owned for many, many years, and they have over $1 billion invested in uh, more than 30 companies. They have placed us with an organization called the Catalyst Acoustics Group. We have the status of sister company within that organization, and we still operate as an independently managed lab. Um, that still serves hundreds of customers across the architectural, industrial, and aerospace industries. So Catalyst and the Stevens Group wanted us to maintain our mission and our standing in the architectural products industry and have promised to make a big investment in improving um, the scope of work that we're doing as well. So there is much more to come. So the the next chapter in our history will be just as exciting and fruitful as the past. All right, Becca, any questions? Uh, what type of testing are you looking to add? Hmm. Well, I guess it's no secret that um, we have had a lot of requests for the ceiling attenuation class, which is um, where you have two chambers with a uh, partition between them and a shared plenum over the top. Um, that one um, is at the top of our list. Um, some other things I don't want to reveal right now, um, but um, they're very exciting. If you have ideas or things that you, you feel that you need or the industry isn't providing currently, um, email them to me or, or give me a call. I do track that every time I get a request that we currently don't have the capability to perform, um, I log that and it, it 
feeds into our um, research and development plans. So we'll probably stay mostly within the, the realm of acoustics, generally. I know people have asked me to do fire testing, but that it would not be a simple task to develop that capability. So. Um, kind of along the same line, someone else asked what areas we hope to grow into. You know, um, I think our focus, our mission is to help product manufacturers better understand the performance of their products. And so I think we'll stay within that focus, but we will be looking at expanding um, what we can test, what we can determine um, acoustically about the performance of, of those products. So. Um, another question, do we have any video or film or even a voice recording of um, Sabine Sabin? Um, you know, I don't, not that I'm aware of. Um, and then, yeah, on the question of the pronunciation of the name. So I've heard it multiple different ways. Um, I think a lot of the Northeast people have said Sabine for many years. I had a professor in college who was French and he would say Sabine. Um, and I say Sabin, and here's why. Um, there was a gentleman named Roy Richards. I think he appeared in this presentation and he's still alive as far as i know i spoke with him a couple years ago and i asked he knew paul sabin and i asked him how did paul pronounce his own last name and he said it was sabin and that actually makes sense because the unit of sound absorption they trunk they cut the e off of it and i think that was to force the correct pronunciation of sabin so so that's how i say it although i've i don't know that any pronunciation is known to 100% to be right or wrong. That's interesting. Regardless, just nice to have that information. <laughs> um, someone else asked, concerning infield testing, is there any printed information that is available or is it all online? So I think they're asking about the, the field testing so that we do remotely. Um, our approach to that, so we don't do consulting work. If I get a request that I believe where they need a solution rather than just a test, I typically send them either to the NCAC or to a consultant I know in their area. Um, we, our niche is for field testing is where you have someone that needs an accredited test um, to document the performance of an existing structure. So we're currently performing ASTM E336. Um, and so, if you're looking for the standard for field sound transmission loss, that's that's it, ASTM E336. We also do ASTM E1007, which is the standard for um, field impact sound transmission. Um, and uh, those are the two main ones. We also do environmental studies, sound pressure level measurements, that sort of thing, or non-standard or custom research projects. Okay, um, someone asked about the novelty testing. So they said, okay. you've been doing the novelty testing. Um, where are you posting this data and how can we suggest uh, potential commodity materials to test? Okay, good question. So this is brand new, this just started. Um, we've only published one currently, um, which was the, the grass, uh, the sod test. You can find that on our website under resources. Blog section. Okay, the blog section. Okay, um, I we post I'll, them to. I'll put the link to that in the chat. Okay, we post them to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter currently, and then on our website. Ideas. Um, we plan to do a lot of these. I would like to do one a month um, going forward. Um, we I have a list that I maintain, and if you have ideas, either email them to me. Um, here at this address, or um, you could even put them in the, on the website, there's a contact us form. You could put them in there as well. It comes to us. Um, you could message us on LinkedIn if you want, but um, the quickest way might be this email address right here. Yeah. Um, I was wrong. It's not the blog section. It's the news section. 
Um, but I included that URL, it's in the chat, and then I also included the URL to the contact form um, if you're interested in giving us a suggestion. <clears throat> I think we did have a plan to eventually move that and create a list in the resources or education. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the website is great and it's a work in, in progress and we're going to be adding to it. Considering it's only about nine months old, uh, it's pretty great, and we're going to be adding to it over time. <laughs> With the novelty tests, the, the quote, the rules of it are there's no products involved, so you can't tell us, you know, you want us to test brand X um, isolation clips and tell you how they perform. That we don't do, um, but what we're trying to achieve is there's a lot of materials and things that are out there that there's no manufacturer for, there's no traditional test sponsor. And so we want to get that data out. Like the grass is a good example of that. I mean, who is funding the acoustical performance testing of grass? And that might be useful in acoustical modeling for a stadium or something on that order. So uh, that's, that's where the, that idea came from. I think we have idea, other ideas like books and, and things like that. Um, I have a, one coming up for the holidays. I think that you know, some of you will get a kick out of it too. So. Nice. All right, um, another one. What is what you might consider the strangest test over the years? Are there any oddities? <laughs> Maybe the floor covered in Coke bottles? Yeah. Yeah, the Coke bottles one, and we're planning to recreate that one, actually. The problem is I don't drink so much anymore. So we're, send us your used uh, empty uh, beer bottles, if you like. So, um, But yeah, we plan to recreate that one. Um, that's high on the list. And that's That photo that's in our museum, everybody points that one out and is real curious about the results. Unfortunately, the original test report is missing. So that's one reason to recreate it. Um, yeah, you like unique things. I think the the guys will say the the strangest thing they've ever been asked to test was um, the construction mesh. You see, um, they they put it out. They they line the perimeter of the, a field that's under construction to prevent debris from rolling across. But it's open mesh, right? But someone paid us to test that for sound transmission loss which was nil. <laughs> so that, that's probably the strangest thing. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you for your time. And this presentation will be posted on our website um, when it's uh, edited. So, um, but yeah, always feel free to reach out. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know how we can help in the future.